This is Aline, and you are listening to Durian Asen, the voice of discovery and sharing. Uh, today, we are going to speak with uh, uh, assistant professor. She's from the University of Philippines uh, School of Labor and Industrial Relations. Her name is Professor Marina R. Serrano. Hi, welcome to the studio. Um, hi, good morning. Good morning. And today we are going to discuss uh, regarding on a book uh, launch uh, and is re regarding on the migrant workers and the rise of non-standard employments in selected ASEAN countries. So uh, how did you come about, you know, uh, with this research? Well, um, yeah, um, actually this uh, research was commissioned uh, to me and, and to my colleagues at the, at the School of Labor and industrial relations by the uh, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung Office for Regional Cooperation in Asia and the ASEAN Services Employees Trade Unions Council. Um, yeah, the, the thing is, uh, in, in the region, in ASEAN, there is not much uh, written about, you know, non-standard forms of employment. So uh, this study, they wanted to try to somehow uh, chart the trends and some practices and uh, regulatory frameworks that in, in, in various countries in the ASEAN uh, that deal with uh, non-standard forms of employment. Mm. So uh, yesterday was uh, the day where you had the launch of the study. Uh, and the book is called Between Flexibility and Security, the Rise of Non-Standard Employment in Selected ASEAN Countries. And a few of um, uh, representatives from Malaysian Ministry came. So can you describe uh, what were you presenting at uh, yesterday's launch? Well, uh, first is uh, nobody from the ministry mm -hmm. came. Um, only uh, a representative, I think, is a consultant of the Malaysian Employers Federation, mm. Co, uh, came. Uh, of course, also the Uni uh, Union Network International Asia Pacific Regional Office uh, General Secretary Chris Eng, and of course, I think also Charles Santiago of the ASEAN Interparliamentary uh, Body. So, nobody from the ministry came, but. Uh, about the book, I mean, or the study, uh, we uh, discuss in the launching. We tried to uh, uh, discuss the types of non-standard, uh, precarious employment in uh, mostly formal enterprises in our six study countries, namely Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. And we also uh, showed uh, some general trends involving non-standard, uh, precarious employment particularly those that uh, involve uh, the triangular employment relationship. We also tried to uh, map uh, some uh, regulatory frameworks on labor outsourcing or temporary agency work in these six study countries. And finally, uh, we tried also to review uh, uh, several trade union strategies and actions that are aimed at arresting the spread of non-standard uh, precarious employment in the six study countries. Mm -hmm. uh, we will focus more on the countries later on, but first of all, what is a non-standard forms of employment? Okay, so um, in our study, uh, we tried to uh, define non-standard uh, employment vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, standard employment, because uh, you see, the, the concept of standard employment is a result of the what they call the Fordist mode of production, which uh, was developed by the Ford company in the early uh, 19, uh, 1900s and which peaked in the 1950s. And the standard, uh, uh, co the concept of standard employment uh, involves several characteristics. One is it is highly regulated and collectively negotiated. Uh, it is spatially concentrated, meaning there is a distinct separate site from the home, which is the, the work site of the standard workers, and the work is uh, uh, full-time and permanent, and there is a gender system in terms of you have a, the male breadwinner and the female house worker. Now, with the non-standard employment, you have uh, the regulated and individually negotiated contractual employment terms, and it involves uh, multiple work sites, you know, so the, the it is spatially variable. Mm -hmm. In terms of the duration of the employment, uh, it involves a variable time, meaning, in short, it's impermanent. Mm 
as against the permanent concept and full-time concept. And this is also the gender system. If before, our concept of standard work or, of, or employment usually is a male breadwinner, now you have a dual earner. So both men and women in the family usually work. So that's how we defined a, a non-standard employment. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, but why there's a rise in the non-standard forms of employment? Come again? Why there's a rise on the non-standard form of employment? as per your title of your book launch? Why, why the focus? Uh, why there is a rise? Oh, of course, uh, there, are, there are a host of factors that, uh, uh, that contributed to the rise of non-standard employment. And in our study, uh, we found some, some sort of an association between the rise in outsourcing practices and the rise in, in non-standard employment. And we observed this one in the six study countries, of course. And then, of course, and we also saw that uh, beginning in the 1980s, when uh, that was the, uh, the heyday, uh, the, the onset of neoliberalism, somehow with the deregulated labor market, uh, the, 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 the propensity to outsource became uh, higher. And this somehow resulted in employers or enterprises adopting more the practice of outsourcing and offshoring. So uh, yeah, uh, of course uh, this is just what is a direct, uh, a direct result. But the, the drive for competitiveness of many enterprises somehow also uh, um, forced them or constrained them to adopt, you know, uh, cost-cutting measures. And usually, the, the, or often, the practice uh, that they adopt would be to cut the labor costs. And one way of cutting labor costs is you casualize labor, you informalize labor, which is, you know, a non-standard form of employment. I see. So is there also a trend of uh, a decline in terms of standard form of employment? Uh, well, in, in some of the countries we observe, like we try to see uh, the trend between regular or standard employment and non-standard employment. And it, it appears that... Um, with an increasing trend in terms of, or incidence in terms of forms of non-standard employment, we also observe like a decreasing or decline in the incidence or proportion of workers engaged in standard employment. And this we observe particularly in the Philippines and to a certain extent Indonesia. It is very difficult. One, one difficulty that we encountered in doing this research is the availability of data in terms of non-standard forms of employment. You know, the countries, all the countries involved in our study, do not have uh, comparable data, and 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 mostly data on non-standard forms of employment are not disaggregated. So you, you don't know which are these forms of employment. They just lump it like uh, uh, part-time work or, or or seasonal or casual work. So. Not all the countries have this uh, very, very specific data, so mm -hmm. for us. So uh, the countries that you did your research are actually quite vast and, and they have different standards as well. Like, for example, I mean, countries like Indonesia, Philippines and Thailand, probably they have uh, different ways in dealing with their non-standard uh, employ um, employees, while Malaysia and Philippines uh, as well. So how, how did you, like, uh, I mean, what did you come out um, and find out about all these different countries and their ways of dealing with employees? You mean the non-standard? Yeah, the non-standard employees. Uh, well, first is uh, we focus on uh, forms of non-standard employment that involve the triangular employment relationship, meaning uh, somehow there are three parties involved in the employment relationship. I, I think you're aware of the, the concept, right, of the triangular employment relationship. So you have a labor contractor or a mount power agency supplying workers, and this is supposedly the direct employer of the workers being supplied. So, that, so you have the manpower agency, the agency worker, and the principal or the user enterprise where the uh, dispatch workers or the workers supplied by the manpower agency actually do work. So this, it involves triangular employment relationship in the sense that uh, the, the agency workers, uh, it is, they are supposed to be uh, the direct employees of the agency and, own, and the user enterprises as the principal 
uh, is the place where these workers are dispatched or supplied and when and where they actually do work so but there is no direct employment relationship or there's no employment relationship between the agency worker or the dispatch worker or the outsource worker and the principal or the user enterprise so it's more on supervision and then the relationship between the principal and the user enterprise and the manpower agency or the labor contractor is a, of commercial it's a commercial agreement so this is what we tried to look into because this is uh, this is more on the uptrend it is form of non-standard employment and we saw uh, the landscape in terms of uh, the regulatory framework is valid. So in some of the countries, the, the, the regulatory framework is more relaxed. Uh, in some of the countries, it is more like highly regulated. For example, uh, uh, we, 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 we consider, for example, Malaysia and Singapore as having a more relaxed regulatory regime in terms of dealing with this type of non-standard employment in the sense that it may have laws and regulations on manpower recruitment and supply, but uh, these uh, laws and regulations are not complemented by stricter and uh, special regulations on the operation of manpower uh, or, uh, or supply and dispatch agencies. So, do, do you think it's the problem with uh, the government uh, putting a more relaxed uh, policy towards you know this kind of uh, regulating uh, employers and employees, or is it because uh, they don't really have you know the a, a specific uh, ministry or specific uh, department to deal with this kind of issue? Well, of course they have. I mean, all these, all the governments, they have a specific uh, uh, agency, particularly the Ministry of Labor, the Ministry of Human Resources, or the Ministry of Manpower. They, they are the principal agency that deal. Uh, with this kind of employment in terms of em implementation and enforcement of regulations. So uh, I think the problem uh, is more on the enforcement. They may have the laws, you know. So even if you have stricter regulations, still this is not a guarantee that, you know, there are violations of rights of workers, for example, engaged in these forms of employment. I think that the issue here is the enforcement of these regulations and the way it is interpreted in practice. So perhaps the trade unions may have a different interpretation of a regulation, and then the employers, on the other hand, may also have a different uh, um, interpretation of, you know, or a more liberal interpretation of, of certain regulations. And here lies the problem. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But why the enforcement is weak? Why the government purposely... I mean, if it's a trend in just con one country, then it's probably the problem of one country, but it's a trend in quite a number of countries in Southeast yeah. Asia where they have weak government enforcement. Well, that, that has always been the problem in many countries in the ASEAN. We always have a spotty record in terms of enforcement of labor standards, right? I think, uh, well, many studies would say the quality of institutions, you know. For example, in, term, uh, in, li li we, we in the Philippines, for example, we have... Uh, so many enterprises to inspect, and yet we have a very limited uh, number of inspectors. So that that's one issue in terms of enforcement, of course. And and, and in some countries, okay, they attribute it to corruption or to even you know, all these other issues. So uh, really, the, the the problem is on the enforcement mechanism. If there are institutions already in place, so and secondly, you know, we also observe that the union density has something to do also with you know, the quality or the level of enforcement of, of labor standards you know, or regulations. We observe that in countries where the union density is, is much, much lower, somehow enforcement of labor standards uh, is more problematic or tends to be more problematic. So, yeah. Has this been attributed also with the decline in trade unions in several countries that you do your research? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, it, uh, the, the decline in terms of union density or trade unions is also a factor. And we observe, in, in so far as the six study countries uh, we, that we covered in our book uh, are concerned, you know, we observe a declining union trend in four of the countries, you know, except, well, Singapore and uh, to a certain extent Vietnam, but the rest, the other four countries, there is a declining trend of union density. And somehow, we, we, we observe a link between you know, a declining union density and the rise of non-standard forms of employment. Mm -hmm. Can you explain more with 
to some extent Singapore and Vietnam where you said they have a better trade union movement there? Yeah, first is, okay, but of course these are different contexts. There's context-specific uh, uh, issues, no? Because, of course, in Singapore and in Vietnam, they, you only have one labor center, you know, one labor federation. So that is why uh, uh, they have a higher concentration of, of union density. So uh, that's why we, we, we put exception to these two countries because of uh, having just one uh, labor center or trade union covering uh, uh, higher uh, coverage of membership and even collective bargaining coverage. So that's how we made exception of these two countries. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, uh, can you explain more countries, um, in individual countries, maybe starting with Indonesia, on how they deal with non-standard forms of employment? In Indonesia, well, in terms of regulation, you mean? Yeah, in terms of regulation and also, I guess, in terms of how um, from the highest level, which is the government, and to the lowest level, maybe perhaps the agency uh, themselves uh, and also the employ employers and employees themselves deal with non-standard uh, employment. Well, in, in Indonesia, okay, we, <laughs> we start with Indonesia. <laughs> okay, so in Indonesia, for, for example... Um, um, we consider Indonesia as having a highly regulated uh, framework in terms of dealing with non-standard employment. Well, we consider it as highly regulated because uh, uh, the law is very specific in terms of um, which, which, uh, well, particularly their Manpower Act, which activities or work can be subjected, for example, to labor outsourcing. And they specify, the law specifies uh, that uh, these activities in, are the following, for example, uh, cleaning services, catering uh, services to workers and laborers, security work, and uh, auxiliary activities in mining and, and, and oil, and of course, transport, transport for workers and uh, laborers. And the law specifically states that only auxiliary uh, services of a company or work or activities can be outsourced or can be subjected to, you know, uh, 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 manpower, work, manpower agency supply of labor. So, um, yeah, in this sense, uh, they have a highly regulated framework. Now, the problem uh, arises in terms of trying to interpret what is auxiliary and non-core business of a company that can be outsourced. And and the, the employers' organizations there are, are arguing that, you know, they, they have a more liberal interpretation of, of this activity. So, meaning they, they consider something that is not, that, that, that is usually core, but then they consider it as auxiliary. This is the, uh, I mean, in, 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 a, in a large, uh, to a certain extent, to a large extent, the regulatory framework, if I may go further, no, between, uh, of Indonesia and the Philippines are somehow similar in the sense that in the Philippines, under Department Order 18-A, as issued by the Department of Labor and Employment, also stipulates that, you know, work or activities of an enterprise that are considered not necessarily core or uh, desirable to the core business can be outsourced. So uh, this is how uh, the regulatory framework, for example, of the Philippines and Indonesia, um, uh, how, how do you call that one, uh, uh, are, are similar. In, in the case of the Philippines, uh, we went further uh, with the issuance of Department Order 18-A mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that, uh, in the sense that, um, um, uh, we in the 18 a uh, we uh, specify that as I, as I as I mentioned earlier um, uh, only the non core business we call it not necessary and desirable to the core business of the enterprise can be outsourced and and we specifically uh, uh, indicated that uh, the, the employer employee relationship that, that there is an employer employee relationship that exists between the contractor or the labor contractor and the employees which uh, who they uh, supply to the user enterprise or the principal you know and then in the event of any violation of any provision of the labor code including um, 
the failure to pay wages, mm -hmm. um, there, there is this concept of solidarity liability on the part of the principal and the contractor. Now, meaning, should the contractor or the labor or the agency fail to pay all the wages and benefits accruing to the agency worker or the dispatch worker, then that is also the responsibility of the principal and the user enterprise. And then, um, yeah, so basically, uh, with these provisions, we consider the Philippines uh, as also belonging to a somehow a highly regulated uh, regulatory framework in terms of dealing with uh, this type of non-standard employment. I see. Yeah. Now, in the do you want me to go from country to country? Maybe briefly from, uh, yeah, country to uh, country focus. Yeah. <laughs> Just briefly. Yeah. In, in Singapore, okay, I go to Singapore. Singapore is a, a very peculiar case, no? Mm -hmm. We may have considered it uh, as a relaxed regulatory framework in the sense that it doesn't have any regulation dealing with outsourcing, mm -hmm. but because they have a very, very long tradition of tripartism, they try to uh, somehow address the spread of uh, non-standard employment in terms of, they call it term contracts or fixed term contracts through tripartite mechanisms. I see. What is a tripartite mechanism? Well, a tripartite mechanism is some sort of a structure where the three social actors, the employers group, the labor, uh, labor group are represented by the trade union and the government, they sit together and discuss and have that, some sort of a social dialogue. Mm -hmm. So they try to uh, address these two tripartite structures. Right? They have this tripartite uh, cluster on contract cleaners. So they address the, the issue of contract cleaners through this tripartite mechanism. And as a result, they were able to come up with a progressive wage model, for example, for contract cleaners, where in this progressive wage model, they try to increase the minimum wage or the lowest wage that a contract cleaner in Singapore, for example, could receive, which is around 1,000 uh, Singaporean dollars. And they have a career path now in, under the progressive wage model. And also a result of this tripartite mechanism is what they call the best sourcing initiative in the sense that they encourage outsourcing companies, you know, to uh, focus on quality and labor standards in terms of being competitive in the cleaning industry. I see. So, yeah. So meaning, even if uh, the, the regulatory framework is not that specific in Singapore in terms of regulating uh, uh, fixed-term work, they have tripartite mechanisms that somehow take the place of this regulatory framework. Do, do you think the tripartite system work in I mean in this in the context of Singapore? Yeah. Does it work in terms of trying to uh, monitor and also trying to improve the uh, standard of the non-standard forms of employment? Yes, because uh, as I said earlier, you know, uh, the, uh, in the case of Singapore, which is a very particular case, tripartite uh, structures or tripartism really works there. So. Uh, Already, already, uh, many uh, companies are adopting this BSI or this best sourcing initiative. And because, of course, the, the government in Singapore is the single biggest user of you know, term contracts in terms of the contract cleaners. Mm -hmm. So they made it some sort of a condition that some of these uh, cleaning providers, cleaning services providers, conform to uh, this progressive wage model for, model for them to be accredited as contractors for providing cleaning services but it's just for agencies. But it's just for that particular industry, the cleaning service industry. Yeah, this is just one. This is just one. But of course, it's not the only. Uh, it's not the only sector where you have term contracts. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, in Singapore, if you, I mean, we all still remember the Little India incident where uh, yeah. migrant workers right. actually, you know, created a, uh, you know, a riot in Little yeah. India. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in a way, uh, a lot of people say that it reflected, you know, the way Singapore government treats the migrant workers there. Yeah, but yes, yes, but that's another point, you know, in terms of migrant workers, and and somehow uh, in our study we we did not focus much on the on this issue, as uh, you know, we, we we have limited time to to really do the study, so our focus. Uh, was mainly on the regulatory framework and not necessarily focusing on the issues of migrant workers. Mm -hmm. So move on to 
and the other countries? Uh, okay, Singapore. Thailand? Uh, Thailand, mm -hmm. yeah. Thailand, uh, for example, is also, we also considered Thailand as having a, you know, it's a special case, rather. Although, special case in the sense that um, they do not have in, in their, in their, in their labor code, they do not have uh, restrictions on the use of outsourced workers or outsourcing practices. But they have a provision in their labor code that somehow uh, highlights or, or, or mandates uh, non-discrimination, meaning uh, it is stipulated there that uh, if the outsourced worker or the non-standard worker in, in, in one enterprise uh, does the same job as a regular full-time worker, this agency or outsourced or subcontracted worker would receive the same amount of wages and benefits as those received by the regular worker. So in this sense, uh, somehow this is how they uh, regulate uh, you know, conditions of, of uh, outsourced or non-standard workers vis-a-vis a standard worker. So we consider it a special case in this sense, Thailand. Vietnam, um, yeah, Vietnam is, uh, unlike in this uh, uh, six, uh, five other countries, they are just starting to, to uh, recognize the rise of non-standard work, although they said that uh, quietly this has been increasing, particularly in what they call the, in the export processing zones. Mm -hmm. Uh, foreign direct investment, FDI sector, and uh, they're trying to, uh, the Vietnam, the Vietnam General Confederation of Labor has been doing studies investigating into this phenomena. So at the moment, they're trying to learn more about the situation of these forms of employment and uh, in terms of um, the union's action towards it, they are still in uh, in the framing process. But what is uh, what is uh, interesting about Vietnam is that it has a very specific uh, their labor law has a very specific uh, provision on labor dispatch. So they call labor uh, outsource workers as dispatch workers. Or, oh, okay. <laughs> or, or or they call it a labor dispatching or even labor subleasing. You know, it is so um, based on the and on the law. It, the, the use of these workers, these types of workers, is limited to 12 months per labor contract. Beyond that, you have to regularize the worker, or the worker w should go to another enterprise. And then, uh, in, in last year, I think, in 2013, Vietnam issued a decree. Uh, I think it's called Decree Number 55, mm -hmm. which took effect in, in July, some, sometime in July of last year. And here... Very, very specifically, Vietnam listed 17 types of work that can be outsourced or dispatched. So beyond this list, you can't outsource or you can't dispatch. That is why we consider uh, Vietnam, in terms of uh, dealing with uh, non-standard forms of employment, particularly in outsourced work or labor dispatch or labor subleasing, these are the terms that they use uh, more on the highly regulated uh, framework. I see. Mm -hmm. What about in Malaysia? I mean, um, I mean, in, uh, a lot. I think there's a huge rise, uh, even physically. You can see in terms of non-standard forms of employment. How do Malaysian government and employers, as well as employees, deals deal with it? Well, uh, yesterday, as as I told you during the launch, uh, Representative Mr. Go from the Malaysian Employers Federation was was there, and he was open to the discussion. And he said uh, he will take uh, the the issues and the, the, the dis our discussions to the Malaysian Employers Federation. So what is what is nice is they're open to the issue. Uh, but in terms of uh, in the case of Malaysia, the conditions of workers. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Okay. First is uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think uh, you may be aware of it, but uh, in Malaysia they also have the concept of fixed-term contracts, and it is also in the in, in their labor code in the labor code here. And uh, there is this uh, contract for labor, right? Uh, contract for labor, which was an amendment introduced, I think, last year, mm 
which somehow tries to legitimize labor contracting you know, mm-hmm. or labor outsourcing, um, which has been, of course, a practice uh, in terms of migrant workers, particularly in plantations and even the, in the electronics industry. Uh, but with this insertion of the amendment in the labor code, even local workers will be subjected to this one. And this has somehow, you know, the introduction of this amendment, which was passed, I think, last year or the other year, I can't recall at the moment, somehow uh, resulted in a protest you know, from the trade union movement, particularly from the MTUC. Mm-hmm. So the Malaysian government, uh, as far as I know at the moment, suspended the implementation of this uh, contractor, they call it contractor for labor. I see. Uh, or, or subcontractor for labor. And only limited it uh, in the agricultural sector. Because in Malaysia, well, as, as far as I know, I mean, and, and also based on studies, uh, there are no limitations set on, uh, on the use of fixed-term contracts. Uh, the maximum number of successive fixed-term contracts allowed, and the maximum duration of fixed-term contracts. So that is why uh, with these uh, issues, uh, with these observations, we uh, consider Malaysia as more of a relaxed regulatory uh, regime or framework in terms of dealing with non-standard forms of employment. Mm -hmm. And why do you think um, Malaysia is not... Uh, it, it is relaxed and and should they like do something do more in terms of trying to strengthen it well <laughs> strengthening uh, what do you mean um, at least I guess a strengthening in terms of uh, ensuring that there's a standard uh, that you know employers need to observe in terms of the non-standard employment or maybe trying to increase standard employment rather than uh, uh, yeah letting the rise of non-standard employments well, yesterday there was a debate on that, mm-hmm. because also uh, a representative from MTUC and many of the labor trade unions were present. There was a debate in terms of, you know, how decent work, for example, as a concept, how decent work as a concept is uh, being uh, recognized or enforced or implemented in, 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 in Malaysia. So uh, it's quite controversial, in <laughs> yeah. Um, because of course Malaysia is a is a labor receiving country, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, the the dirty, dangerous uh, jobs are not being done by the locals or the Malaysians, but by migrant workers. So uh, in 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 this sense, uh, the law in terms of protecting uh, uh, migrant workers is not that uh, how do you call that one? not that uh, deep or or not that restrictive in terms of uh, implementing or enforcing uh, uh, the the rights of workers and and their their conditions. I remember, for example, one study, case studies of Flexitronics, right, and the Jabal, I I don't remember at the moment, and which looked into the conditions of, you know, foreign workers, migrant workers in the electronics industry in these enterprises. And there are many violations, particularly uh, wages uh, being withheld and, and, and many other things, conditions, they're living in you know, worse housing conditions, etc. And these are not being addressed at the moment. So, uh, yeah, so basically uh, it, it is also complicated in, in, terms, in, in the sense of, in, in the case of Malaysia, because uh, there, are, there is more to be done in terms of imp- improving the regulatory framework that deal with uh, non-standard forms of employment, particularly those that pertain, uh, that involve or pertain to a uh, migrant work. Mm-hmm. And what I noticed in the pamphlet for the yesterday's uh, launch is uh, the welcoming remark was done by the General Secretary of the ASEAN Services Employees uh, Trade Union Council. Mm-hmm. I'm just wondering, uh, has the issue of the rise of non-standard employment in ASEAN has been addressed to that level? This is what uh, the labor movement in the region is trying to do. Mm-hmm. They're trying to engage uh, the ASEAN, particularly the ASEAN Labor Minister's meeting, on this issue, 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah. So this is what uh, is in the agenda of the of the uh, at least ASETU, you know, ASEAN Trade uh, ASEAN Service Employees Trade Union Council is doing. So and it, this is one also this is also one of the purpose purposes of the study, you know, trying to have more evidence based uh, study on this type of employment. So when the engagement with the ASEAN leaders would take place, you know, hopefully, then we would have more evidence to back up, you know, this engagement. You know, that mm-hmm. is but this is what the trade, uni- the trade unions are doing. But what about the receiving end? Have they really, like, um, understand the situation and do something about it? Well, I can't, I can't, <laughs> I can't answer that <laughs> at, at this the moment. moment. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think uh, we would have to wait and see when, you know, the, the engagement starts. And uh, we would know the result if they would do something about it. But I think at the level of the ALM, the ASEAN Labor Ministers meeting, they are very much aware of what is happening. They know that these things are happening. So it's just a matter of trying to push more, you know. Having uh, the political will, I guess. Yeah, yeah, push more this uh, uh, coming, the push which should come from, of course, the the trade union, the labor movement themselves, uh, Mm. itself. Yeah, to to really elevate the issue and try to address it on a regional level, in the ASEAN level. Mm-hmm. And my final question of today is about your study. So, what is the outcome that you you want to recommend to um, ASEAN leaders uh, regarding on uh, the rise of non-standard employment? Well, we uh, we provided some recommendations actually in mm-hmm. our study, but apart from that, of course, we highlighted some good practices in terms of regulatory framework dealing with non-standard forms of employment, particularly uh, agency work or, or outsourced work. And somehow through this, the, 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 some of the ASEAN governments, which are you know, trying to deal with this phenomenon, may, good, may, may get some you know, uh, uh, good practices in terms of laws. And then um, in, in, in our study, we are arguing for a multidimensional approach in addressing uh, the rise of non-standard employment, you know, of course, uh, in, on the part of the trade unions, it's always organizing and in innovating uh, representation models for non-standard workers, and of course, the issue of uh, you know recognizing and revitalizing uh, the collective bargaining mechanism, meaning trying to extend the coverage of collective bargaining to include non-standard workers and bargaining for their regular regularization eventually. Of course, we uh, also uh, tried to uh, highlight the importance of social dialogue mm-hmm. through tripartite structures. I mean, collective bargaining, uh, in, 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 in a sense, is also social dialogue, but mostly bipartite at the enterprise level in our region. So, um, yeah, and then... We recognize uh, uh, limitations in existing labor laws, mm-hmm. but uh, it doesn't stop there. I know the labor laws may not be that extensive in terms of providing or protecting wor- non-standard workers, but there are other uh, ways in which, uh, beyond the labor law, there are things that can be done by governments. For example, enforcing a uh, a minimum wage or living wage policy mm-hmm. that covers all types of workers, not only regular workers. Mm-hmm. Would you also recommend um, having a more in, in strengthening the trade unions in all countries that is involved? Yes, of course. Uh, that's uh, the main uh, uh, recommendation. Like just recognizing the right of workers to organize and bargain collectively. You know. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yes, that, that is part of our, our recommendation. And also, we advocate for uh, universal social security coverage, mm-hmm. like covering all types of workers or all workers, uh, providing them with social security and health care coverage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so to everyone, regardless whether they are you know, migrant workers or, so, precisely. or you know, in, involved in non-standard employments. Yes, mm-hmm. yeah. So, yeah, there, these are all... These, this is, these are all what the government can do, you know, in, in trying to uh, provide or accord protection to the non-standard workers. Mm-hmm. So, anyway, uh, that's all we have for today. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it has been a very, I think, 
a very good awareness to all of us in terms of trying to understand the rise of uh, employment, especially non-standard employment in selected ASEAN countries based on your uh, study. Okay, thank you very much too for uh, inter for this interview and for inviting me to talk in your uh, show or radio station. Yeah, welcome. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.